because the, the amount just this person yeah. can tell us about the, the nature of everyday life in Raymond London. By looking at the, the shape of, um, of their upper jaw, their maxilla, yeah. we can see that they are of African descent. And then the Romans had like these very peculiar ideas about what toothpaste should be made out of, like various kind of dry dog poo and <laughs> it's just better left. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, we just won't explore that. So Rebecca, where did the Romans bury their dead in Roman London? Well, like every other town in the Roman Empire, they um, were instructed by law to bury outside of the Roman walls. Right. Uh, which kind of works a lot of the time. So we have burials um, all around the city walls, but of course as the settlement grows, people burials end up being encountered. Yeah. And then we also have quite a few um, burials that we would call um, like clandestine burials. Oh. So there is um, a man who was put head first down a well. Really? Um, <laughs> there, oh my word. Uh, lots of kind of bits of people that we find in uh, rubbish heaps. And are there any specific um, sort of cemeteries that we know about sort of around Roman London? Um, well, most of the time, I know them by their streets. Right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so um, we've divided them um, according to the compass points. And to, just to make it easier, to, because, we, because there's so much development in London, you have lots of um, individual sites that are actually all together for right. big cemeteries. And Rebecca, were people buried in different ways, sort of throughout the chronology of Roman London? Yes, and that's re a reflection of um, where people are coming from. You have very distinctive um, patterns within the whole burial population. So Roman London, it's notable for not having very many grave goods. So most people we find don't have anything. Right. And that's because, you know, if they're buried with textiles or wood, that doesn't survive. There's also, um, as you say, the chronological difference. So very early on, we have these incredibly wealthy high status cremations of um, men and they are clearly being buried in a Mediterranean style. We have uh, people in wooden coffins as well. We also have some very high status burials um, like the Spitalfields Roman woman where they're buried in lead coffin and those lead coffins have been brought to London probably um, from elsewhere in Britain. So if you look at a skeleton like this person then, because this is a person, mm -hmm. um, what sort of scientific analysis are you doing here to both date um, the burial but also to look at where this person may have come from? So the skeleton captures lots of information that we don't find in any, any other form of archaeological evidence. By just looking at the skeleton we can see um, for, for this individual they're female, they've got really wide sciatic notches and also the shape of their cranium tells me that as well. Right. So you can see that her upper leg bone has been cut and that's her femur, and we took a bit of bone out of the femur in order to um, date her burial, because she's one of the very late Roman burials that we have, and um, so we wanted to kind of see exactly when she was being um, buried, and that came out as um, the early 400s, wow. 300s. We also looked at areas of her pelvis, so this bit here, and that can tell us how old she was when she died. So okay. She was um, about 36 to 45. Okay. We don't know what she died from um, because nothing came back in the, in the DNA analysis about that. So if people have often have things like tuberculosis, that shows up. The, the DNA of that disease will, can be found. Okay. Um, but what it did tell us was that she actually has light brown hair. Wow. Which is, which is really, um, <laughs> really amazing. Yeah, unfortunately it didn't work for um, her eye colour or her skin colour. Right. You may have noticed that on her jaw there's a little bit of green staining. Right. And that's because she was buried with these enormous brooches that are wow. like these huge pepper pots <laughs> um, that were joined together by these really beautiful um, chain of uh, glass beads. And so they would have been like absolutely like you couldn't have missed them. Right. She's also was then had this um, bone comb which was placed behind her head. Right. These are what are called um, Germanic objects. So they're found in uh, Roman Germany. By looking at um, the chemicals in um, the your dental enamel, the white hard dental enamel, we were able to show that she was actually born outside of Britain, so she's probably spent her early childhood in the in the German area right. of Europe. So she's someone who grew up 
on the continent had a very visible um, like expression of, of her uh, community and came to London but then she was buried with like all of her um, kind of cultural signifiers which is which is really nice because then we see that elsewhere in Roman Britain towards the end there's this very clear kind of um, expression of German identity. Um, so which of the cemeteries in Roman London was she actually buried in? She was buried um, in the Eastern Cemetery, so her excavation was on Mansell Street. Right. That area seems to be used in, in later, in late London as well, um, whereas other areas seem to kind of go out of use a bit more. And, and within society in Roman London, does everybody get the opportunity for a burial? There are several ways of looking at that, because <laughs> it's Roman London. Right. Um, so you get people who are buried in what archaeologists would describe as normative. Right. So um, you're in one piece, and you're either, you know, people might put in, a, you know, in a pot or a coin or something, and you're buried in the cemetery, and then you stay there. Right. Um, we have other people where um, you, they're just represented by a body part. Wow. Yeah, so... Um, oh, my word. We, uh, recently at Crossrail, they came across um, just the cranium, so just the top... Right. Um, ...of of of people's heads, um, which were deposited in a ditch. There's a person down a well. Um, you sometimes get, like, odd body parts found in ditches. Um, and then in one uh, case um, in the northern cemeteries, where it was very, very close to the Woolbrook, and it was a very interesting decision that they made to create a cemetery on ground that frequently flooded. Right. So um, you would get um, burial washout, so bits of people, as they decomposed, obviously don't stay together. Yeah. Um, so where, when it would be flooded and things, bits of people would then be kind of like washed away. But the ritual side of it is really important for the Romans, isn't it? Because they clearly mark this divide between being living and being dead very seriously it's very important to them oh absolutely yes and there and there are some people um you know we've got evidence for um decapitation burials which some people are arguing is actually quite normative right um where and there's um there's a woman again from the eastern cemeteries where um she had obviously been buried whole and then after a, a period of time um they had reopened her burial um, and then um, they hadn't cut her head off, they pulled it off. What? And then put it on her <laughs> pelvis. What? And then covered it up again and then left her this really, really beautiful pot. We've got people who are buried with restraints wow. around um, their ankles. Slaves. Maybe. It's difficult to um, really get to grips with that because... Um, you would think a lot of the time that they'd, um, because sometimes the metal would have a higher value than the person, so you'd think they'd take it off. Oh my <laughs> word! They haven't. Um, so there's a, so there's a, like there was someone buried with two very large um, metal rings around their ankles, um, and then they thought that there might be a chain in the middle, but when they X-rayed it, no metal was shown. Right. But there's been cases. Um, recently of of someone where they're they're definitely shackled and there's a padlock on on the chain so we do have evidence for um enslaved people being being buried like that um there's a huge amount of, of burial ritual we get a lot of prone burials things like that so it, multiple burials as well there's one from southwark where it's um a, an adolescent who's buried with um a small child and then um, an infant and the infant's actually got a tatina proper special feeding vessel wow so they must have all died relatively within um, a short period of time to be all together and, and sort of topically at the moment obviously people are talking about pandemics etc we know that mm. pandemics were, were very common in the ancient world um, do you have any evidence from any of the burials of, of a pandemic in Roman London no, we don't. Um, but there is um, a DNA evidence for the Justinian plague um, elsewhere in in Europe. Okay. So, so they found evidence for that. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the things we did screen for when when we did the um, DNA work. But unfortunately, all we found was um, for everybody that we did that they had gingivitis. Right. 
<laughs> they just had really bad uh, teeth and yeah. gums. Yeah, because they can't clean their teeth properly. Right. And then the Romans had like these very peculiar ideas about what toothpaste should be made out of, like various kind of dried dog poo and it's just better left. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> yeah, we just won't explore that. Um, but it's it's because the um, a lot of the time because the the as they make processing the grain the the quern stones they're using because they're quite rough in order to break that grain down right um small bits of the um grit actually become incorporated in flour so that wears people's teeth down. <sighs> so um the soft dentine inside becomes exposed and then they get the dental caries because it's softer and the um it's 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 easier for that dental caries to take place uh, we've got the we've got calculus as well like plaque that's building up um, it's also, I mean, town. It's interesting because when we look as a whole for Roman Britain, people buried in towns tend to have higher rates of dental disease compared to rural people. But what does that tell us about the diet of Roman Londoners? Roman London, if you wanted to eat anywhere in Roman Britain, yeah, this would probably might like, be one of the best places to choose to eat. Right. Because we have <laughs> um, loads of evidence from um, all of the remains of seeds and um, plants and things for all the lovely Mediterranean imports. So um, where you've got the destruction layer at number one poultry, you've got um, dates which have been carbonised. So it looks a bit like the pictures we're familiar with from Pompeii. Right. And um, we've got things like black pepper, cumin, um, loads of herbs and spices all coming from the Mediterranean. So that, to me, speaks about this sort of cosmopolitan nature of Roman London, where yeah. for the majority of time that Roman London existed, a lot of the population weren't British at all, no. but came from across the Roman Empire. Yeah, and you can see that quite a lot. So through the uh, inscriptions, so you've got a lot of um, military recorded through tombstones. I mean, we know that the military had burial clubs and stuff, so, so they were being buried in a very formalised, very recognisable way yeah. within the military community. Um, and so, yeah, it's just it's just really interesting because, as you say, it's like this absolute melting pot. London seems to have been kind of a, a space that was on the border of lots of territories. Yeah. And so there wasn't really a tradition that kind of kept per, um, being perpetuated like other areas of Britain. Everyone who came kind of like just kept doing what they did. So, Rebecca, what can you tell us about this person from Roman London? Well, although... There's not much of them left, which is a great shame. I've got bits of their spine, I've got like this bit of their face, and I've got a bit of their pelvis. But actually, it is like so much going on, it's unbelievable. So um, with, with the bone, you see it's like a very like fuzzy appearance, and um, the inside of it is really, really dense. I mean, the pelvis is a dense bone anyway, but this, this doesn't look right. You can see it in the pelvis, you can see it in some of the lumbar vertebra, which are your lower vertebra. Right. And you can also see it in the jaw. Right. And this is actually Paget's disease. So this is a disease that um, that isn't acquired, so it, it's just something that your body decides to do. And um, is, is very common um, up in... Um, the northwest of Britain today. Okay. And so this is one of the early people we have from Britain with Paget's disease. Okay. And that would have been um, made them, you know, made their joints quite stiff. Sometimes it's very painful. Right. And then, um, if that wasn't enough, they've then got this disease here, which um, fuses all of the vertebra together. So it looks like someone's melted candle wax down the vertebra, and that would have made their back very stiff. Oh. Probably quite painful. And then they've also got ordinary osteoarthritis, which most people <laughs> tend to acquire. So they're not doing very well. This is a really unlucky person. Very unlucky person, but they've got like, this is like the only person I have with Padgett's from Roman London. So he's like super exciting. And we don't get a lot of people with this disease either. Okay. So we can look at the dental wear. So we know that because they've got both their molars and they're really worn, that they're probably someone who's um, over 35. Pro they're probably in their 40s. Right. Um, but because we've got this bit of their face, right. um, we can apply some um, forensic methods which allow us to help um, identify um, people's population affiliation. So by looking at the, the shape of, um, of their upper jaw, their maxilla, yeah. we can see that they are of African descent. Okay. So that's... So that's really important because it's showing us that London is very diverse. And then we took um, one of their teeth and we looked at um, the DNA and the DNA they have is commonly found across Europe and North Africa. 
But the caveat with the DNA is that that's modern people. Right. Okay. So that's where people with those with those um, DNA uh, signature are found today. So if it's all across Europe, then actually the Romans were pretty much all across Europe. Absolutely, so, yeah. Um, so that kind of fits in with that quite nicely. So the, the, the amount just this person yeah. can tell us about the, the nature of everyday life in Roman London. Yeah, absolutely, because there was no grave goods. There's just literally these few bones all jumbled up. And they've revealed so much, it's amazing. And one thing I actually noticed is how worn those teeth are there. So that must have been very painful. Yeah, because the um, inside your tooth, so you've got a hard white crown, right. and that's really tough, but it gets uh, worn out because um, the grain and the, that they're eating has, um, because of how they're um, grinding it, you get bits of stone incorporated in it, so it's like a sandpaper on your tooth. Wow. And then that exposes the brown soft dentine, and that's like really, that Ouch. would be really sensitive. Goodness yeah. me. And what, what yeah. were they taking for sort of pain relief for that? Um, well, I mean, we know there's kind of lots of recommendations um, in the medical literature written in the Mediterranean, and they're saying, you know, things like poppy, um, that kind of stuff, poppy syrup to kind of relieve pain. Um, and all sorts of other various crazy medical so, concoctions. So, so poppy syrup, yeah, which is an opiate. Yes. So basically, yeah. they're taking opiates for toothache. Victorians did stranger things. So oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely amazing.